others. <laughs> it's impossible. I was like in denial about it. And then I, you know, I gave it to my girlfriend and she's like, I've been trying to tell you this for years and you just haven't listened to me. And now I have proof <laughs> from a non-biased third party that agrees with the fact that you are just completely unorganized. So it's, uh, I'll tell you, it's been a big, big piece just to understand how I communicate with people. Because DISC is a great tool for hiring people, right? You want to make sure that you can set proper expectations for people. Because a lot of times we, sit, we hire people that are just like us for the most part, right? That becomes, it becomes a weird situation because there's a lot of traits that you have that you don't really want to duplicate, right? There's, you want to have balance across the team. And what I notice for the most part is people just feel comfortable and hire people that are just like them, okay? So what we found with DISC is, DISC does a couple of good things. One, it's, it's a proper expectation for the person you're hiring. Can they really function in this capacity for a long period of time? If this person does not like talking to people naturally, they're just naturally adverse to just completely just engaging with people, social environments, or talking to people, maybe customer service or sales, not the best fit, right? If this person is completely disorganized, has no process, does not want process, does not like process, and then you put them in a situation where they have to function following a process all day, and then they don't follow process and you're let down. Right? But at least you get a better chance knowing from the beginning well, how to set proper, just put people in the right seat of the bus. Now, that's a great side of the disc, but I think the most, most important part of the disc is how you come off. Understanding yourself and how you, can, how you communicate with your staff is a huge piece to this. Because understanding how you can maybe mismatch with people, you, you, as a manager, as a leader, right, half the challenge is getting people on the same page with you. How do you get people to be on your same page? How do you communicate your message and motivate people accordingly? That's, a huge, that's, that's the biggest challenge, right? How many have a challenge with that right now? How many of you got it knocked down just so you know you can communicate with your staff perfectly? Everyone is on the same page. There are no communication issues at all. And again, the people that are not raising your hands, excellent. Thank you very much. Right, so, is it just too early? I know we're like I know we're on the West Coast. We're normally doing this like all over different time, time zones, but is it just too early for Seattle? Should we start like at around nine tomorrow? There's like Starbucks around here. I know there is. We can get you guys some more coffee. All right. So what I noticed is again from understanding how to communicate properly and effectively to different people is a huge piece. Now, if you have a, if you have a a form that tells you, hey, this person likes short, direct communication, all fact-based, no stories and you get right to them, you communicate to them the way that they want to receive information, your message gets interpreted and received a lot more effectively, and you ultimately get the message across your team in a more efficient manner. Does that make sense? All right, so we're going to talk about how to use DISC effectively, and we're going to talk about the, uh, the attitude assessment as well. Besides DISC, there's two other assessments. There's the PIAV assessment, which is personality, uh, interests, attitudes, and values. And that assessment, what it does, it breaks down why people are behaving that way. So if DISC is the how they're behaving, right? So what they're actually doing, the attitude assessment is why they're that way. From a, from a management perspective, this becomes really crucial because now I understand what ticks, what's making this person tick, why they're making the choices they're making. And I can also motivate them accordingly as well because just because the person naturally likes talking to people, this is a high influencer, they like talking to people, they might use that trait or that behavior set in a different way. Maybe they're a better teacher, educator, Maybe some people just like talking just, just, just to talk. But you at least know why they're the way they are. Okay? Then there's also the sales skills index. How many of you have hired a salesperson that hasn't sold anything in the last six months? Anybody? How many of you are that salesperson that hasn't sold anything in the last six months? <laughs> okay, so, and how many of you, have, have you, let's say a year? Anybody? I can see it in your eyes. Some of you in there are just like, just don't want to raise your hand. It's still too early. We haven't got to know each other well enough yet, so I understand. But I've seen that before, and I'll tell you what, as a sales professional myself, if I'm not producing anything six months in, I will self-terminate. I will self-destruct. I will go ahead and just tell my boss, hey, look, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's me. It's probably me, but I can't figure out how to sell this. <laughs> so, you know, I, I just, it doesn't make sense, right? Now, most, most of the time, it's just due to lack of training. For the most part, most salespeople never really work on their craft. Just, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole cornucopia of reasons as to why this is, and we can get into this later, but the reality is most salespeople, just by nature, really don't work on their craft like, like, a, like, a, like an athlete would or like anybody else does. Pro most professional salespeople that I've seen, very few of them, the top, the top, top, top of the, of the salespeople that I work with, 
typically are, are adamant, they're obsessed with becoming better at what they do. So we'll talk a little bit about why that is, but there's a sales skills index assessment that figures out how much training this person's had. Do they have a process? Do they understand sales? How long is it going to take to train this person, to get them to where they're fully functional and capable of actually selling? So we'll get into that a little bit later at the end as well. Okay, so before I get started, any questions on DISC at all? Any questions? Anybody confused by the DISC? <laughs> no? Okay. Yes? Okay. Yeah, there, and that's a great question. So the question was, is there any way that DISC can figure out people are cheating or trying to game the test, right? Trying to figure out the test. How many of you had all of yours, all of you, when you look at your natural assessment, if your natural DISC assessment on the natural side, all the bars, are all close to 100? So you almost aced the test. How many of you got that? Anybody felt they, typically that doesn't mean you aced the test. When you, when you have all of them at 100, okay, the test knows it's un you're unmarkable. They, they actually, it's called unplaceable. You can't place you on the disc wheel. That the test knows you try to game it. So if you're all the way, if you felt like you failed it because you had your zeros across the board or all you know 20s across the board or you got all 100 and you thought you aced it, you probably you probably game the test. The test is trying to figure out that you weren't answering the questions consistently across the board. Does that make sense? So that's the easy way to figure it out. Most of the time when I see that happen, it's just people that are just overthinking it. They're just, they spent, they're overthinking the questions, they're overthinking the responses, and that lets me, in a little, lets me in a little bit about the person as well, too, that I'm dealing with. Just the fact that they even were overthinking something as simple as the disc lets me know a little bit about who I'm dealing with, okay? So, the disc, what it does, it's just behavior, it just measures behavioral patterns, observable behavior. This is stuff that you can see. You can see the way that people are performing, the way that people are behaving, right? If you look at, let's say, for instance, somebody like Bill Gates, he has a very observable disposition about himself. He, you can see the way he is. He's naturally very aggressive as a person, right? Okay? Doesn't measure ability. So just because they have a certain skill set or their behavior says they can function in this capacity doesn't mean they can actually do it. Just means they might be best suited for that role. Doesn't mean that's something that they actually will excel in or succeed in. Does it measure their ability at all? Doesn't measure experience or training. Okay? And there's no such thing as a perfect sales profile a perfect engineering profile, management or leadership profile, there are certain things, there are certain characteristics that might make it easier for you to function in that capacity, but it doesn't mean that that's going to be the perfect profile for that position. I've seen some people who, just by looking at their disc, probably shouldn't be in sales, but are excellent salespeople, just because they've learned to adapt and modify their behavior accordingly. Okay. So, the DISC language. That was broken down by D-I-S-C. Okay? Again, these are all observable behavioral traits. D stands for dominance. Typically, people that are very high Ds are typically very dominant. They usually get into, you know, their, their leaders, they, they want to drive. Okay? People that are high Is are influencers. They're the people that like talking to people. They're naturally magnetic. They usually engage in a long, sometimes pointless conversations. How many of you are high Is and know you can easily get thrown into left field? At any time, you will follow a shiny object right out of this room. Okay? And the high S's, we're going to get into a little bit of that, but we call them the poker face. People that are usually very steady all the time, even keel. This building can be on fire right now, and they'll be like, okay, it's on fire. We've got to get out of here. <laughs> you can, or, the, or they could have just won the lotto, same face. It's hard to tell. People that are high C, typically very compliance oriented. It's all about process. They need rules. They're rules followers. They want the order, the way to follow the steps. They want the recipe the same way every time. So we're going to talk about how the high C's work as well too. Okay, now if you look at your disc profile, there's two areas, right? So it breaks you down natural and adapted. Your natural style is what to focus the most on because that's how you are most of the time, right? Adapted is how you are with a moderate amount of stress introduced into your environment. You know, work, right? How many of you have a, at least a moderate amount of stress in your work environment? <laughs> right, exactly. So what I notice is, under cases of extreme duress or when people are really under the gun, they revert back to their natural style. So if I see a big discrepancy between their natural and adapted style, that's telling me they're probably flexing too much. They're, they're doing a lot of mental gymnastics to have to function in the capacity of doing at work. And in cases of extreme stress, 
that they revert back to their natural style. So I set my expectations accordingly. Now what I find is there's typically two characteristics that are most dominant. So if you click the natural or your disc under natural style, there's typically two that go higher or that are above the 50 line and the rest are below. Doesn't mean that you can't do those things, right? It just means an order of priority in the way that you behave or how you act, you might you know, you might talk your way out of it. If you're a high I, you'll talk your way out of it. If you're a high C, let's just say, you might look at the plan or you might start looking at organizing before you start talking, explain the plan. Does that make sense? Okay. So the high D. People that are high D, typically very demanding, right? They're usually very aggressive, competitive. People that are high D hate losing. How many of you are high D in this room and are very competitive? Just the thought of losing at anything, even, it can be part cheesy, just drives you nuts, right? They also are, again, being a high D comes to a certain amount of, of managerial expertise. You've got to think, this person wants to drive. They have a lot of initiative, which can be good when used for good. When used for evil, <laughs> the high D is a very dangerous weapon, okay? How many of you have a high D right now that is just a loose cannon in your office? It's just, they, are, they have a short fuse and anything can set it off at any time, Okay? Now the good news about the high D, if you're the high, how many of you, how many of you are the high D? You know that you're this short fuse in the office, you're the live wire, okay? The challenge with the high D is, the high D, especially if you're a manager, you can blow up and get over it in a second. So you get really mad and you're just frustrated and you got it out of your system and it's over. Okay, back, let's go back to work. Let's talk about what we're doing over here. Now, for some people, that can put people off big time. What I notice is most business owners are high Ds. The, most, the typical characteristic of business owners, D or I, that's typically the two most dominant misbehavioral characteristics for, for leaders or owners of, of businesses. Now, what I notice is that the high D sometimes, they can just railroad their people and not even know they're doing it. It's that self-awareness thing. Because you might respond to that, hey, somebody yells at you, fine. I'll brush it off my shoulder. We might engage in, those, in, a, in, a, in a highly spirited conversation. And after that, it's over. We're back to being friends again. Or some people, they'll stay with that. So it's really important, that's why I talk about disc, that self-awareness factor of the disc, understanding how you come off, understanding how you can create potential mismatches with your staff, is probably the most important part of this entire tool. Does that make sense? So if we look at a high D, who's a perfect example? If we had a public figure, just observable behavior, if you think of a very aggressive, dominant, just has to lead kind of person, who's a public figure that comes to mind? Donald Trump, Donald Trump absolutely. <laughs> right? Now they can, now Donald Trump, right? In his own mind, you know, he, he's obviously a successful person, successful business person, has been a lot of successful businesses, but, you know, he can come off as somewhat arrogant, right? <laughs> somewhat, slightly arrogant. He can come off as, you know, he's, some people have been told, I've been told he's not the most humble person. So, and he doesn't even know. He probably doesn't even know, he doesn't realize the extent that, of the perception that people have of him. Again, it's that self-awareness factor, right? So a lot of times also, you don't even understand, why are you crying? I wasn't yelling at you that much, right? So it's, again, really understand where you're at. But Donald Trump's a great example. So the high eyes. People who are very high eyes are influencers. So the people that, how many of you have more than 200 friends on Facebook? Those are the high eyes right here. Everybody's your friend, <laughs> right? I just met some guy on the plane today. Hey, this is great. Honey, he's going to take care of the kids. He's awesome. He's, I just met him on the plane. He's a great guy, <laughs> right? So you want to find out, usually very trusting, right, can get into just any conversation about anything. How many of you have staff members right now that you ask them, hey, so what did you do this weekend? And you have to prepare yourself for a 45-minute conversation, okay? So high eyes are typically the people that, again, they like to engage in conversation, naturally talkative, right? Who's an example of somebody who's a very high eye? Public figure. Oprah Winfrey strikes me as more of a D than an I. She's got that subtle kind of, I will stomp you out if I could. <laughs> if you give me the opportunity, I will get in the octagon with you. I have no problem with that. Sarah, Sarah who? I'm sorry? Ellen. Ellen, Ellen I, I get Ellen. You know, who, you know what comes to mind for me usually is uh, um, Robin Williams. When I think of Robin, have you, have you seen Robin Williams do stand-up comedy? He is all over the place, right? He gets in, he's constantly jumping from joke back and forth. You've just completely lost track of where he was going in the first place, but it's all funny. You have a great time. And high eyes are all about the experience. They love having a fun experience, fun atmosphere. As soon as things get boring or no longer the experience is something that's, that they're into, they lose interest fast. How many of you are high eyes in the room? 
And this describes you perfectly right here. As soon as, right now, you are just bored of me just talking about the same slide. Okay? <laughs> so people who are low eyes, typically, again, doesn't mean that they just, they're just not high priority. Talking first is not the highest priority. They prefer to be kind of left alone. Right? So what's a good position, typically, for a high eye? If you're looking to hire somebody, what's a good position for a high eye? Sales, typically most salespeople or customer service are high eyes. Now there's a downside of the high eye. Typically high eyes lack a lot of process, lack a lot of documentation. How many of you have been trying to get your salespeople to document their auto tasks or connect wise to no avail? <laughs> Anybody have that challenge right now? Salespeople not documenting every single granular step of the sales process the way you'd like them to? It's not going to happen. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Set proper expectations. Exactly. You should just read their mind, right? So that's the high I. The high S, people who are very high S, typically, again, we call them the poker face. They could have the entire world falling apart around them or won the lotto, even keel. Typically, when I look at the high S, it's just a pace thing. They, rushing a high S, that is the best way to freak them out. They need a good amount of time to process everything. They are much more about quality over quantity. High S's love doing things right. Just got to give them all day on it. To give them a long timeline, set expectations properly. So if you're a high D and you like to go fast, right fast enough. You want it yesterday. You want it five minutes ago. And the high S is kind of like, hey, settle down. You get tomorrow. It's a day. That drives. Can you see where the mismatching starts happening? Right? Now, but if you set proper expectations for time, now high S also, you got to adapt a little bit as well too. You know, you have a very high D boss, you have a, high, you have a short timeline, you got to pick up your pace a little bit. But that self-awareness also, that's where it comes in handy with the high S as well too, where they realize, hey, I got to pick up my pace a little bit, I got to move a little faster. Does that make sense? So high S's are very loyal for the most part. They're all about the relationship in the office. They like a harmonious work environment. High S's love to be in a situation where Everything is just the same as it was yesterday, easy going, not a lot of changes, and everybody's just, you know, kind of relaxed, all right? Now, who's a good example of a high S, public figure? Obama? <laughs> Obama kind of comes off as a little bit of S. I get, I get kind of an eye out of him, though, too. He seems like a guy that would just talk to you for a while. But who's, who's, who's somebody that comes, that comes to mind as a high S? Think steady pace, easy going. Bush. I, 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 like, I, I think of like maybe Barbara Bush, just kind of real easy going, doesn't like, hey, I don't know what's going on, just over here growing my flowers. <laughs> right? So, you know, the high S typically, again, somebody just more about a pace thing, understand set proper expectations for that, but they're much more about quality than quantity. Now, the high C's, high C's are all about compliance. These are very analytical, detail-oriented folks. How many of you in the room are high C's? Right, so the fact that we're running a little behind here in the schedule is probably driving you bananas right now. Okay, so I, and you probably caught some typos. Like you can catch typos at 100 meters away. Right, I've noticed that. High C, excellent at attention to detail and process, figuring out all the in-betweens. Now, this can also pose its own set of challenges. High C's sometimes can get very myopic in their view. How many of you have noticed if you're high C, have noticed you'll just get caught up on an insignificant detail and can't get off of it? Right? And sometimes you lose sight of the big picture because you're so hung up on this one small detail. So high C's, while they're really great to have very organized, very process centric, it's really important to kind of think about, you know, where does this person fit in my team? How can I best utilize their traits naturally, right? So typically what makes a good, or if you're thinking about a good role for a high C, what, what would be a good high C position in the company? Accountant, absolutely. You definitely want a high C accountant. What else? certain degree, because it depends on where the eye's at. I think, I think managers have to have a certain level of eye because they've got to relate to their staff, right? But if you look at the high C, like most engineers typically, I notice there's some kind of combination of C. They like the process. They like the same steps. They're very organized for the most part, right? So I notice that most engineers are some quote of a high C. Now, who do you think frustrates the high C the most? The eye, right? Any question? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> well, I think, and that's, that's, it's funny you bring that up, because it's absolutely a good point. The high D and the high C sometimes, they can clash. But what I notice is there's typically the combination I see is DI and DC. I notice like IS and even, you know, DS, very kind of rare combinations, right? But especially for, for management. So it could be the other combination. So you might be, are you a DI? Yeah. And your wife's a DC, you think? Very process oriented, oh, yeah. more organized? That's where the challenge is at. You're both very aggressive, yet you kind of want to talk it out. And she's like, hey, you did not put the, you know, the cookies back where they go, right? So. <laughs> exactly. So I, I, I know from, per, from per first hand experience, my girlfriend is probably the most polar opposite. If you look at the disc profiles, when I was studying it, I became a certified disc behavioral specialist. And I was going to the test, and they have this compatibility wheel. So it shows you kind of where you fit and how, you know, just, just kind of how compatible you are. So our profiles were the furthest apart from anybody else in the book. It actually said we shouldn't even be friends. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, this is kind of weird because I, you know, I like my girlfriend. You know, we have a good relationship, right? So, and it, I mean, our wheels were barely touching. And I'm thinking, you know, this, this explains a lot because early on in our relationship, you know, we'd, have, we'd get very frustrated with each other, right? Like, for instance, I would like to go. Sometimes I just grab cereal. Hey, the cereal goes back. Wherever it lands in the, in the cupboard is where it lands. It's, as far as I'm concerned, you're lucky I got it up there, Okay. She has the cereal, like, alphabetized. It's all, all in alphabetical order. She has the Cocoa Puffs before the Frosted Flakes. And that's just the way it has to be. And it would drive her. She thought I was doing it on purpose. That I was doing it like, hey, I'm just. And again, it's that, it's that setting expectations. When we had each other's disc, it was just like the manual of how to communicate with each other. It completely alleviated a lot of the just minor little arguments we get into. Not all the way. They're still there. <laughs> but... You, it just, again, you stop making people wrong for not being like you. Because you see that firsthand they're going to be a little different. How can we utilize this person's strengths to counter, you know, counterbalance what we're, we're weak at? So high C, who's a, who's a public example of a high C we can use? I typically think of Spock, right? If Captain Kirk, Captain Kirk's a DI to me. The guy is just, he just likes to have a good time. He just wants to go meet the Martian ladies, right? And Spock is always like, well, look, Captain, I think that we should probably do these things. And they end up, you know, Spock's usually 95% of the time right. Okay? So if we look here, high C is usually very careful, very detail-oriented. And if you look, this is a, think about this. How many of you have a sales staff and an engineering staff that are just ready to kill each other? <laughs> That's just ready to have a Braveheart-style battle in the middle of the office any day now. It might be happening right now that you're not there. Okay? Horses and everything. I've seen this happen because, again, salespeople, different behavioral profile, engineers, different behavioral profile, and they're making each other wrong for not being like the person. Engineers thinking, why can't you bring me a needs analysis form that's totally filled out? And the salesperson's like, look, I closed the deal. It's your job to clean it up. <laughs> right? And they're not meeting anywhere in the middle. And it's, again, that setting proper expectations. They have to learn how to, this will help out so much. In our office, we have all of our disc profiles, just kind of what we are, dominant features. Hey, this is the office of a DI. You know when you come in here, prepare yourself for a long conversation and don't start talking about details because it's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm just not going to have the answers you're looking for. Okay? And again, I know if I go into our CEO's office, it's a very high DC, I have to reduce my story time, so I got to get right to the, he has a famous phrase for the DI, it's like, just fast forward me to the end. Just fast forward, I, want, I don't want to see the credits, I just want, just give me the ending, <laughs> okay? Just tell me how the story ends. And then I know I come in that, I have to come with that, and I have to come with facts and bullet points and just get right to the point. But again, it's knowing how to talk to people, so it becomes very important when I was talking to your clients, too. Now, your clients, some people I've seen do managed services that just provide this to their clients as a value add. Because think about how great that is in the onboarding process. If you have their disc, it tells you how they like to be communicated to. Some people, some of your clients are not touching enough. Some clients you might be touching too much. Right? So this is an easy way to help you communicate. Also becomes a very valuable tool for upsell because it tells you how to sell them right here. All these people have different buying styles. They all buy and make decisions differently. So understanding how to communicate effectively to these people, understanding how to not create mismatching helps your customer service and helps your overall sales technique. Does that make sense? So if you look at a DI, and can, you, don't have a, you don't have the luxury sometimes of walking in the office. How do you figure out this person's a, where they're at? I typically use process of elimination. Over practice, over time, you start kind of figuring it out. I'm like, I'm a good 65, 70% now without even reading the disc profile. 
I can start figuring out where people are at. Because you can see a lot about just people's body language, their disposition. Again, if you come into your client's office and you ask them, hey, so how was your weekend? And they give you a 45 minute response, right? this person's probably some combination of an eye. Right? How many of you have been in a sales engagement and the sales, the sales call just went way too long and into left field and you guys didn't talk about anything that you went there to talk about? Right? That typically happens. You get two DIs. This is another thing too. You get two eyes in the room and they can go into left field very quickly. Okay? I call it the squirrel syndrome. They're easily squirreled in the conversation. How many of you have seen the movie Up? Yeah, squirrel, right? As soon as, what? Shiny object over here? And you both just follow. All right, let's go over there. All right? Now, D's, you get to a D's office. How many of you are in a sales engagement or your client, even if you're just in your quarterly business review and the client's like, all right, what do you got? Let's go. Let's go. Shut up. Let's go. Right? I know they're probably somewhat of a D. They just want to get right into it. There's no warm up. Now, C and S, this is where I start figuring out. If the person's kind of just agreeing with everything I'm saying, I'm just kind of laid back and not really engaging, kind of more moderate, toned, just kind of even keeled and, and just kind of agreeing with whatever I'm saying and not really engaging in conversation, probably somewhat of an S. Even though in their mind, they'll be the one like, I'm not going to buy any of that. <laughs> but they're like, oh yeah, sounds great. And a high C, again, typically will just challenge you. That is completely false. I bet you some of the C's in the room right now don't believe anything I've said this entire time. <laughs> you guys need empirical data backed by three verified resources and a quantum physicist before you believe anything I've said. Which is okay. I understand that. I'm not making you wrong. I just got to come with the facts next time. So here's an example of our CEO, Gary. Gary is a DC. Very high DC. If you look here, his natural style, right, his D is still pretty much the same. He's pretty much the same guy. Not much of an adjustment. He's a little bit more talkative if you catch him like off, off, off work hours. But during work, his eye drops and he sacrifices some of that eye for more process. Okay? Now, if you look at our accountant, Quinn, right? Naturally, she's a very high eye. I had no idea that she was a very high until we went to like Christmas party and I drove with her. I maybe heard this girl talk a paragraph of actual conversation in the office since the time I've known her. We got in the car and she started like just... She just was a completely different person. She was talking about her family and her husband and everything that's going on. And I was like, who are you? <laughs> it's a completely different person. She sacrifices a lot of that eye. Her S pretty much stays the same. And she's very attentive to detail. But you see her eye picks up just a little bit. That's a reflection of you know, having to work with a lot of Ds in the office. And she's got to get the numbers quickly. But we want that attention to detail. She can take all day as far as we're concerned. As long as the numbers are great. So here's a disc wheel, and we have our whole office laid out. We can see where people are at. And this is, again, it's understanding how to create balance in the office. Like right now, we're a little weak in the S area. Our, our company's pretty young, we're fast growing, so there's much more Ds in the office than Ss. Does that make sense? So it's, it creates a little bit, again, we have to adjust for those challenges, but we're always looking for balance across the board in the company. Because if you look here, right, if you have too much people, or just like yourself, too many DCs, everybody's going to be arguing about how to do it. Everybody wants to lead. Right? That's where you get into those situations. Your office just is like down, down, back, dead. Because everybody's arguing. Everybody has to be right. And nobody wants to follow. Or if you get too many people that are just S's, nobody wants to make a decision. Or I's. Everyone's talking and having a great time, but nothing's getting done. Okay? So it's really important to have balance all across the office. And what I'm looking also here is I look for fluctuation. If this person's making a huge leap across the board into something that's totally opposite, they're making a lot of mental gymnastics to function in what they have to do every day. All right, so the values assessment. This is the attitudes behind how you're behaving. Okay? So if you look here, this is why you take action. Typically, it's a viewpoint. It's a way of valuing your life. It's a mindset. This doesn't change. This is pretty much how you've been since your entire life for the most part. Unless the times I've seen it when it changes, when something like really drastic happens in your life, something, you know, major life change. You can fill that in wherever, wherever it makes sense, but typically it's, you know, something drastic has to happen for your values assessment to change. But typically what I notice is there's, there's, most people are broken down in these areas, right? So there's two dominant traits that people fall into. Theoretical is the search for knowledge. How many of you right now Google something and just get lost in Google? You all of a sudden will just look for something and you're like two hours in, 50 tabs open on your browser, and you have no idea what you really started looking for, okay? Theoretical people, for the most part, just love finding that knowledge, looking for that research. Utilitarians are people that everything they do has to have an ROI attached to it. 
typically is compensated financially, or there has to be some kind of gain, some kind of juice for the squeeze. Okay? The aesthetic, people that are highly aesthetic value things just kind of like their office that makes it look really nice. How many of you have people in the office that just, you know, their office is really decorated, a lot of art in the walls, they're typically, you know, their desk is really, has a lot of cool trinkets and things going on, right? They're, they're all about making their surrounding look really nice. People that are high social are much more about, this is kind of more, they're, they're into philanthropy, they're into really doing a lot of nonprofits, charities. You find that people that are very high social are, are, are very into helping others. It's not so much kind of talking, it's more about helping. Okay? People that are individualistic are extremely competitive. These are the people that it can't just be enough for somebody to lose, right, or somebody to win. It's not just enough for somebody to win. They have to, somebody has to lose, and they have to know they lost. They have to know not just that they lost, but that they were beaten by you. So if you're a high individualistic, you will walk over to the person and be like, that's what happens. That's what happens. <laughs> right? So high individualistic, these people, again, you have to motivate them differently, right? And people that are high traditional just have a system for living their lives. Typically, these are people that are involved in a lot of religious activities, pastors, I notice, and, and people that are involved in church. Okay? Now, where this becomes important is if you have a staff member and knowing how to get them to work a couple extra hours, how do you do that? So if the person is not motivated by money, how do you get the person, so for instance, say I have a high individualistic in the office, right, an engineer, and I need him to work and spend some extra hours this weekend working on a project. He's not really motivated by money. How do I get this person to do what I want them to do? Be like, hey, I was talking to John down the hall, and he says you couldn't do it. I mean, I was trying to tell him you could, but he says, you know, there's no way you could handle this. Now, I don't know, right? And the guy's like, I'll show John right now, <laughs> Right? So again, different ways to motivate people. Now, if you have somebody who's a high social and you want more couple extra hours, how do you do it? Right? If you tell them, hey, look, maybe you give me a couple hours this weekend and I'll try to find some time, I'll donate to charity or I'll spend some time working in your nonprofit, whatever you're involved in, I'll help you with whatever you need help with. And that might get the person, or you just tell them, look, I really need your help. That natural inclination to want to help will just drive this person, but you've got to really sympathize. I really need your help. I need you to help me with this thing. Does that make sense? Right? So if you're looking at utilitarian, about the money for the most part. Now, where this becomes important is if you have a salesperson who's very low utilitarian and very high social, they might have a tendency to give away the farm sometimes. How many of you are salespeople that know you just give away too much? You fold way too easy to your clients. And it's all because you want to help them. You care about your clients so much, you feel that oh, I can't, I shouldn't really charge them an extra $20 a user. You know, that's, we're making enough money. <laughs> right? So that, that's, that's kind of where you're at. You've got to really look, when you're thinking about who you're hiring, the value assessment attached to that person, how are they using, how are they using the attitudes and how are they displaying it. So a person that's very high theoretical, high utilitarian, is going to look for knowledge, want to share that knowledge, through their, they, have their high, they have a high eye, they want to talk about it, and they're also motivated by money. So that whatever they're sharing, there's going to be some ROI attached to it. Does that make sense? Again, that's maybe a person who's naturally best suited for sales. It doesn't mean they can actually sell. But those are people that right now might even be, how many of you right now, just if you, you catch a good deal like on TV or something, you on a TV or flat screen at Best Buy, and you have to tell everybody about it. And you might not be a salesperson. You might be somebody else. But you catch a good deal on something, some fantastic value on something, and you're sharing it with all of your friends and making them buy it. Some people are salespeople just naturally all the time anyway. Okay? The sales skills index answers the question, how long will it take to train this person? That's all it does for me. It tells me, what's the learning curve going to be? We have a pretty tight winter at MSP. We have six weeks to get you off the ground and running. If you are not trained in six weeks, we just, we're just, we just don't have any more time to give you. So we have to look for certain people that already come with a certain set of acumen and skill set before we bring them on board. That makes sense? So the SSI is just a training measurement tool. Also, how many of you are salespeople here again? Okay, so how many of you have been through sales classes that was just pointless? You were sitting there the whole time going, this is nowhere, anything that I came to look for, this is not helping me out at all. Because it's not really targeted, right? So that's what we use the SSI for, is to figure out, because it breaks you down. What it does is a general assessment of just your skill, of just general sales acumen. It also ranks you amongst top performers nationwide. Not just in IT, just in general sales. So you see where they're at, but you'll see where they're strong at. So this person might be a great closer, but horrible at warm-up. Or maybe they're very bad at qualifying. But at least you know, if you take this test, where you have to focus your training on. 
It's much more targeted, and you're not wasting time in areas you already know. Does that make sense? So, when you, do, when you look at your SSI assessment, how many of you in here are taking your SSI? Anybody taken SSI before? Okay, so the SSI, if you look at it, it breaks you down in three different categories. What to do, what not to do, and general knowledge. What you want to do is you want to add up the three scores at the end, and it'll give you just kind of this cumulative number here. And what you want to do is, when I look at, when I'm looking at this assessment, anything below 180 at MSP University, we just can't take on. Just the training time is outside the six window curve, we've noticed. Anything a 180 above typically means this person understands the sales process. We just got to interject kind of our process and what they're already doing. It's going to be a little bit faster. Doesn't mean just because they're below 160, they can't sell. I've had some people that I've worked with that are multi-million dollar salespeople that scored a 135 on this assessment. Because they have their own way to sell. It's not, you can't replicate it. You can't train what they do. It's just kind of the way that they are and they have their own style. It's effective, but you just really can't build a team on that process. You can't really forecast that. Does that make sense? This test, if you want to get these assessments, you can get them through partner support. So if you email partner support at MSPU.us, um, we sell these assessments. So the DISC is 45, the SSI is 55, and the values assessments are 65. Okay? So. I know we're running a little over time, we're leaking in a break here, but anybody have any questions on their disc, 